All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending today's webinar. Today we're going to be talking about nice label automation and how you can automate and centralize your label printing with your existing business systems. So we have three different levels of our automation product. Automation Easy, Automation Pro, and also Automation Enterprise. So there's three different tiers that you can choose from depending on the type of integration that you're going to be doing with your existing business system or application. Uh, so today I'm going to be hosting the webinar. My name is Nick Sanis. I'm the marketing director here at Nice Label Americas. And also on the line we have Tim Panazzo. He is our field service engineer at Nice Label Americas. So he is uh, definitely deeply involved in a lot of automation implementations we've made. So he's been on site in a lot of customer locations deploying Nice Label automation, configuring it with their existing business systems, and also you know, setting up templates and designing the workflow to work best for their organization. So he's going to show a live demonstration uh, after a couple of slides here. But uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the agenda for today, we'll be talking about integrating printing with your existing applications. So depending on if you have uh, pieces of hardware, like a serial device, scanner or scales, that could initiate automated printing or you could conduct printer replacement uh, as another method of as another method of basically uh, uh, adding a new printer to your organization replacing old legacy hardware so a lot of people have trouble when trying to support new printers and new label designs in their organization so that's where nice label automation comes into play We'll get into the Nice Label product line. I'll cover the three different editions of the automation from easy to pro to enterprise. And we'll show you, you know, the different features within each of the editions so you can know and decipher what's the best product for your application. And what Nice Label provides, you know, we're providing integration into basically any type of existing business system and allowing you to support new label designs and new printers. So if your company is uh, consolidating their label printing or wanting to deploy labeling across multiple sites in their organization, then that's a great time to bring Nice Label in, you know, deploy a centralized printing option get all of your label designs on one platform and then have a flexible solution that you can grow with and support really any type of change that you want down the road. So offer, we also offer the ability to give you custom printing workflows. So if you have users who want to uh, make barcode scans, upon those scans they want a label to automatically print or if you have a type of production line where you have scanners or you have a scale weighing a package or uh, in some type of other you know food environment that you're weighing uh, different food products you can automatically print labels at that time so a lot of the times there's a couple different pieces to the puzzle here when you deploy label printing you may even want to set up a uh, custom printing screen and then that can also interact with your production line to drive maybe your print applies or you have uh, scans that are made as the package comes down the line and then that also can interject different data onto your label. So you can see there's so many different possibilities when you're dealing with label printing in an automated fashion that you need a flexible solution. And today we're talking about the Nice Label Automation product line. But you're still going to use the Nice Label Designer Pro to set up your label templates. So that's really the core behind label design and your variable label templates that have variable data on them that would be populating data from your existing business system. So in theory what you're going to be wanting and requesting is how do I get this data from my application whether it's Oracle or SAP, you know, JD Edwards, you know, some old AS400 or Unix system and how do I get that onto my label and 
through to the printer. So that's where the Automation Easy, Pro, and Enterprise comes into play. So the first step is design. You're going to set up your label templates in that nice label designer pro software. So you can design regulatory and compliant labels with this tool. There's really, you know, no label that you can't design. It's, you know, very easy to use software and you can import images, add any barcodes that you'd like. And then those are basically going to be empty variables. So you'll have an empty barcode or empty text field with a certain amount of characters that it will allow and then at print time, the automation product is going to basically pass data through to those variable fields on your label. So you're not even going to see nice label uh, through the printing process. It's all going to be behind the scenes, very transparent to the end user. So it's a very seamless implementation. And um, the second part of the puzzle here is control. If you have, if you're a regulated company, that uh, under the FDA or EU GMP standards, uh, there's a lot of different control mechanisms there that are necessary to control your label files to make sure they're validated to be printed. You need to have them approved by certain users before they can be rolled into production. So that's where our control center products come into play. And that's just a complementary tool to our automation product that's handling all the printing. So again, here is the Nice Label Designer Pro software, version 6. This is the latest and greatest we offer. and allows you to set up really any label template that you want. And you can see here, these fields in yellow, they're the fields that are variable. So they're just waiting for data to be populated from your existing business system. So after you set up this template, you're going to store these labels in a directory somewhere on your computer or in a centralized network location and it just has to be accessible by the automation server that would be residing on one of your Windows uh, server boxes. So the automation product, this is installed on a Windows server 2008 R2 or now it can be 2012. So it's typically installed on a server handling all the printing behind the scenes. And users can start out with Automation Easy for simple text file integration, could be printer replacement, database triggers, depending on if you add a record to a database or a record changes, that can automatically print a label. So simple text file drops to a folder from your application, that's the most common approach. But stepping to the Automation Pro, that's where you can get into XML file integration. So we'll talk about that and show you a live demo here of what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, but then when you step into Automation Enterprise, that's where you get more advanced triggers for web services, and you can do more complex database triggers. So uh, we'll talk about that as well, but that is usually the top tier when you have more corporate-wide implementations. So how does automation work? Well, first, your user is going to execute a business transaction from your host system. So your host system that contains the data, that is the system that's going to be outputting some type of transaction. And, for example, if it's Oracle or SAP, you know, it could be a, a XML file. Or from older legacy systems, it could be a text file. There's many different ways that this business system can transmit data. Those are just a few. So once that occurs the business system generates a trigger. So that trigger is going to trigger printing. So it's going to output that data somehow to the uh, centralized server. So typically um, a text file would be sent from that application and dropped into a shared folder. Uh, some call it a hot folder. So your business system is constantly sending those print, print requests and the automation server is monitoring that location or monitoring that TCP IP socket connection for data coming across. So once that trigger occurs, we detect it and we analyze that file. And Nice Label Automation is basically programmed to look at this certain folder for this data. Then once it finds the data, it reads through the file and it looks at various elements. So it would look at the variable data, pinpoint those variables 
also find the printer name, the printer quantity, and also that label name that's going to be referenced. So it pieces all of those aspects together, and from that intelligence, it then can drive that printer with all the proper information, the proper label, down to the correct printer on your network. So in theory, it's just a transaction from your business system. As long as we can get data from your application, then we can use that to print labels and support new printers on your network. And a lot of times people get stuck with using their old printer or using an old label template that they can't modify anymore. So now we're giving you more flexibility. So when you get into Nice Label Automation Easy, here are some of the triggers and filters that you'll be able to use. I mentioned the file trigger. That allows you to drop a text file or CSV file. Drop that into a folder or send it through a TCP IP socket connection. Uh, for other serial devices, you can connect up a scale or a scanner. You know, it could be uh, you know, some other uh, you know, older type of equipment on a production line. Uh, you know, anything like that. So we can basically sense data coming across that serial port and then use that information such as uh, a weight and use it on the label template. Or if you have a database that you want to add records to or maybe you modify a record, Nice Label Automation Easy can monitor that database and upon a change or an addition of a record, it can automatically print a label with that data. And uh, some newer features that we've added in this latest product are filtering unstructured data. So this is where it gets really cool in integrating and replacing old printers. So doing printer replacement or analyzing very crude label uh, you know, data streams. So you could have a very unstructured text file come across and Automation Easy has some intelligence to read through that and decipher what are variables and what are not. So then as you keep sending data across, it can filter that right information. So that's a, a very cool tool that we'll show you here in, during the demo. And showing you how to filter structured data files. So if you have a CSV file, for example, we can import it in. And then you can see the data preview. So we're separating each field of information and then uh, basically turning these into variables that will match up with your label variables down the road. So you have your series of actions here. You're using the filter. You're opening the label, setting the printer, and printing the label. So you have your series of actions here, and you have your data mapping right in the middle. And this auto mapping tool automatically grabs these variable names, matches them up with your label variables that you've connected and selected. Now for unstructured data, that's uh, you know very ugly looking old invoices that may have some really weird looking uh, structures to them that are not consistent. You know, previously we needed to have some consistency in order to pull data, but now we can pull these older legacy files and basically select the information we need, and we can use this as a uh, specific variable field on your label. And I mentioned hardware and um, you know scales, PLCs, uh, you know any type of system that maybe a PLC would supply you with a specific value, and then that value could be looked up into a database to pull that product number or product information onto your label. Uh, so here are some of the other actions in the Automation Easy product. You know, simple general actions for opening and printing your label, setting your printer, setting variables, using filters, getting down to connectivity where you can send data back to a port, or you can write data back to a database, or you can read data from a serial port. You know, execute different scripts. So I know Tim has done a lot of customizations with this product. So if you do a little programming, you can take automation easy a long way. So uh, in a nutshell, there's a lot of functionality inside automation easy. So that first tier of automation, you really get a lot of value for that product. 
But once you get into higher end systems, you know, Fortune 500 companies, uh, they might have Oracle or SAP or some type of large ERP system. You know, we can basically grab data from their system and use that to print labels. So the Automation Pro would be the next product that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'll show you how you can deploy these servers. There's two different methods to deploy it when you're dealing with a larger organization or a corporation. You'll have your whole system here, so either SAP or Oracle, and that's going to send a print request to the automation server. So, so far we already explained this. So that's a very simple process. Once that occurs, the centralized automation server can deploy that print job to any printer on the network. And these could be in different locations. You know, potentially it could be around the world or in multiple states or multiple countries. So you have one centralized server distributing that print job across the network to many different printers. So it's centralized. If we go to the multiple server approach, you have your whole system, but that whole system is going to send that file. It could be a text file, XML, or it could be a web services trigger. That could be sent across to that specific location. Location 1 would have nice label automation installed. So each location has its own automation server. So this is uh, the best approach for high volume printing, high throughput, when you have a lot of printers at each site and you don't want to worry about network traffic potentially bogging down printing. So this is a more reliable approach and uh, some locations they may choose to even have a backup server to kick in in case one of these servers fails for some reason. Maybe you have a hardware fail. So there's a lot of different backups that you can also add, but you want to make sure to get a full analysis from our team to determine what's the best approach for your organization so you're not going to have any potential issues for lag when you're trying to print labels or any other potential issues for downtime that could affect your whole organization instead of just smaller remote issues locally. So there's a lot of potential for redundancy. We just have to uh, analyze your environment, and then we can determine the best solution for you. And uh, for the Automation Pro triggers, uh, you have the file trigger, serial port, database, TCP IP. And you also now have the XML data filter. So you receive the XML data, so you can receive native XML and Automation Pro automatically analyzes that file. So that's the big addition compared to Automation Easy. You get the XML data structure. When you step into the Automation Enterprise, you're getting web services and the HTTP trigger. So when you talk about XML, you can basically import an XML file and the Automation Pro will be able to decipher this and break out what are the variable pieces of information, what are the variable names. And then that's really key to integrating and deciphering what data is what. Then Automation Pro can automatically match it up with your label and with your printer. So there's been a lot of uh, basically intuitive features added to the automation product line, just trying to make it easier for users to get a, get a handle of, you know, learn from scratch, and then also uh, reduce some of the more complex, uh, you know, features or complex tasks that, you know, had to be done in the past. So for integration options, the HTTP trigger, web services, and XML, those are the main additions that you're getting with the Automation Enterprise product. And you can see them listed at the top. And whenever you install the NiceLabel Automation product, you can download the demo from our website, nicelabel.com. And then under the file menu, you can change it from Automation Easy to Pro to Enterprise, so you can test out these different features. So that's a 30-day demo that gives you a lot of power to, uh, to demonstrate and make sure things work correctly before you buy the product. And there's a lot of other uh, specific actions that have been added, too. 
uh, you know, getting into variables, uh, you know, run XML commands from SAP and Oracle. You know, we also have an external adapter for Oracle customers that we actually have installed inside of Oracle. So you have you know, faster printing as well as the ability to send confirmations back to Oracle saying this print job was successful. So we do have some additional adapters for different business systems uh, and we're also adding more and more as time goes on. So it's just a, a tighter integration that we're trying to make with additional business systems. And for example, here's an X, XML filter for SAP where we can pull in the XML and match it up with the appropriate variables on your label. So this is an example of the XML filter for SAP users. So the uh, automation product I showed you, that is what's handling the printing. But also, we give you a tandem product, the Automation Manager, which is basically a desktop application and a diagnostic tool that gives you statuses of your print jobs. So you can see what's going on, and you can basically you know, select your triggers, start and stop them. So it's just giving you an activity view of what's going on so you don't have to go right into the automation where you can modify triggers and make changes. So this is more of an administrative view and oversights. So you're getting uh, an overview of all the activity going on. So that's one of the associated products that's included. And this is the interface of what it looks like. So you have uh, a couple different tabs here at the top. Uh, it's a very modern Windows 8 interface, but uh, very easy to use and very simplified. So under the triggers, you can see you know, how many triggers are in action, errors, how many are idle, stopped, and then all the other configurations that you do have. On the right side, you can see all these specific triggers in action. So here's an Oracle XML file trigger that's in action. It's running. It had one error. And you can see these other triggers that are also running, from text files to uh, CSV file uh, integration. And then you have some other ones. We show web service trigger or HTTP trigger. These are stopped. So you just get a, a nice view of what's going on. So uh, I talked about analyzing your environment to determine the appropriate workflow and the appropriate nice label automation product for you. So once we determine you know, the correct structure, the correct deployment, we'll also talk to you about setting up a backup server or disaster recovery server, you know, anything that can help uh, prevent the potential for any downtime. Some people want to test the triggers on another server, test it with a label file, make sure everything is great and working before they deploy it to production. So we'll help you architect the appropriate amount of backup servers or QA servers necessary. And comparing the additions, just, just a brief recap here, talking about Automation Easy, more for CSV or text file, uh, TCP IP integration, uh, printer replacement, then getting into Automation Pro, we're getting into XML integration. And Automation Enterprise is when you have you know, full-blown corporations using the product or doing web services type of integration with uh, a web application. So you'll get into more load balancing and failover support with that automation product. And also certification for SAP and Oracle with the automation product as well. All right, I'm going to uh, open up the full nines here now for Tim. Yeah, okay. Okay. So uh, Tim Panazzo, uh, he's our field service engineer, so uh, he's very experienced with our nice label product, so he'll give you, uh, you know, a brief rundown of how the automation product works, so you can uh, take a closer look. Good morning. My name is Tim Panazzo, and I am the field support engineer. Um, one of my primary tasks here is everything enterprise-related. Also, um, 
I'm here as the uh, you know the direct support for our, for our resellers out there that want to get involved in these automation projects. So if you need uh, uh, you know a face out there to make the sale and all that, uh, uh, when the request is made, there's oftentimes that I'll travel out there. I do the requirements gathering, the solution designs and builds, and the implementations. So and that's via both on site and uh, I've done a fair amount of them uh, through remotes. So it's, it's technically that simple to do. Now, uh, before we get started, I just want to give you some of the, the, the technical requirements of the product. Uh, it's got a very light footprint. It's going to take uh, 512 meg to run at its minimum requirements. It will run on any operating system from XP all the way up to server 2012. Um, a lot of times licensing is done in conjunction with the product we call Control Center. Um, it doesn't have to. The product does stand on itself, by itself, and you can just enter a software key to get it activated. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple other things that we often like to talk about. Uh, the print engine used is a true 64-bit print engine at this point. Um, the Pro and the Enterprise versions are multi-threaded. So there's a little bit of added memory requirements for each thread we decide to turn on, usually to the tune of about 40 megs per additional thread. Uh, the other thing that the products will run under is Microsoft's clustering services, and this is where we start talking about failover and load balancing. Um, in today's infrastructures with the use of VMware and Hyper-V and things like that, Failover sometimes is often done by other means than in, in a clustering way. However, where uh, clustering still becomes advantageous is with load balancing. Um, a good example would be is, is that we uh, recently have done a bid where the requirements were to spread out two to three million labels to 450 locations in a few hours. How do we do that? You know what I'm saying? So that's that's the uh, that's the potential of the product. So with that being said, um, what I'd like to do, and uh, I want to thank Nick for uh, uh, some of those pics that he showed, because I'm going to tether, I'm going to show you that unstructured example. I'm going to kind of go into that from a live perspective. But before I get there, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to show you just a simple uh, structured data import and uh, a trigger design. And then I'm going to follow it up at the end with um, an XML presentation also in the Pro. So, and then if time permitting, um, I'm going to show you some of the advanced features we can talk about when we uh, deal with integration. On install of the product, there's two components, and uh, Nick alluded to this. What you're looking at on the screen right now, this is the builder. Um, in the builder, um, what we can do is if we go into tools, oh, I swung and I missed, I apologize for that you can see that this is where we're going to assign our product levels. So we can go right into here, we can hit easy, we can open a configuration file, and uh, we can start here. But the builder allows you to select all three. It's going to be your licensing that actually, and I'll show you this in a second, it's going to be your licensing that technically, um, let me put that in here real quick, that handles it. And while I'm waiting for that, um, this is the second part to the installation, which is the automa automation manager, which Nick talks about. Technically, this is the, uh, the part we're paying the money for. Now, on install of this product, it's going to ask you to, uh, to give a service account. Um, if people are familiar with uh, our old NiceWatch product, um, we, give, we gave you the choice to run that as an application, or you can go into the tools and register it as a service account. With the new product, we don't give you the choice anymore. It has to be a service account at that point. Um, that would be the uh, uh, one of the bigger changes there. And, and more importantly, when we think about service accounts, we have to think about permissions across the whole enterprise structure. So if, you're, uh, uh, if your picture repository is sitting on one machine, um, you know, labels are sitting somewhere else. We have to think about making sure that the Active Directory administrators give our service account permission to hit those locations. The other big pitfall I often see is that since we can save settings in the label to push out to the drivers, these service accounts would also uh, have to be able to do uh, hardware changes so that we can send our commands to change uh, driver settings through the label. So um, with that in mind, let me get into uh, 
uh, an actual breakdown of some of these triggers. So um, what I'd like to show you first and foremost is kind of a structured data filter. And again, the goal of automation is to take data from a system, we're going to parse that data out, and we're going to send it to a label. Um, and as you can see from my trigger, and I'm showing you a drop, drop file trigger, and you'll notice if you're familiar with the old nice watch, the interface is definitely different. What I can assure you is, is that if you look at it, all the features that you're used to in the old nice watch product are here. So a good example would be with the drop file trigger, we're looking to monitor a folder. So now we can either detect a specified file, or we can actually set up a generic folder for the drop and then we can sit there and we can mask uh, you know, for what we're looking for. Um, execution events aren't on the first screen like they were in the old, uh, the old product. You can see here that all those settings are still here if we want to use them. The big one I often use is to delete that trigger after we spawn an event so that we can keep that folder clean. Now, we have many ways to archive this file if need be. It may be something as us creating a simple VB script just to do a copy and paste into another location. Remember, too, that the automation product has logging features. More importantly, if bundled with what we call the control center, that particular application is monitoring every move on your labeling system. So there are many ways for us to get the, uh, the checks and balances we need as we're passing data and printing labels through the system. The other big thing now with the new tools on top of VB scripting for programmers that are more comfortable in Python would give you that option. So with that being said, again, the goal of automation is to uh, take data and filter it. Um, in these constructs, uh, we have to think about the filter. The filter used to be a tab in each, uh, each trigger that we would create. Now we break it out so that it's real easy. And let me go into the action list real quick where we can sit there and assign different triggers at any given time for that, or more importantly, the same, the same uh, filter for each trigger that we create. So going back into it, to create a simple structured text filter cannot be any simpler. Um, if we're familiar with actually importing a text file into Excel, the, uh, the technique is the same. You would sit here, you would go into, uh, you know, find the particular uh, file that you want to use as your reference file for your, your filter. Um, we go into here. Uh, you can see that I'm using a, a CSV file. Once we open that up, you see it starts the text wizard. And it should be very familiar with people that uh, are kind of used to these things. You can see that in my particular case, this is a delimited file. The first row contains our field names. Um, we're going to parse that out by, and I Bear with me, I forgot to look to see. It looks like semicolon, so it's already found that for us. And then we go through our product set our field lengths, and we already have the name for our field structure. So once that's in place, um, and let me go back in here, um, you can see that it breaks it out for us automatically. It gives us our identifiers, gives us our field names as such so that we can sit there and it's actually showing you and that's the nice thing about this new tool is all through this process it's going to give you the ability to uh, get some visual feedback to make sure you're on the right track so you can see that it's itemizing out uh, or, or at least highlighting our various fields so going back into uh, uh, this trigger there is a subtle difference between the old product and the new product is that you know short of the database trigger, you're going to need a filter, and we have to assign that right off the get. Once that filter is in place, <clears throat> you can see that the field values come in. It becomes a simple mapping at, at exercise at that point to the variables that we have in our project, to the field names that we created in the filter. How do we get the variables into the product or, in, or into our project? Simply all that we have to do, we have multiple ways to do it, but the big one, in order to marry them to a label, would be to uh, use that import uh, variables tab, and then you would go out to your uh, your solution at that point, and uh, you know grab some of your labels there. In that case, I was using the pasta, but if I would select open, it would bring it in. Now, if we need internal variables into the system or or, or project specific variables, we could add them at, on the fly um, with the same rules that apply as before. Now, what's interesting about that? is that uh, uh, we 
are a little more flexible with the limitations on the variable length. So we do not have to set a length of the variable. We let the tools kind of handle it for ourselves so that we don't get a lot of those frustrating errors with uh, variable lane sizes not being passed into the label correctly. Um, once your variables are in place, again, marry your, uh, your variables to the field names that you created in your filter. You're going to open your label. And in my particular case, what I've done is I, I'm actually using a static call to a label. But if I had uh, a message in there, say, for label templates, I can sit there and use a variable reference if I want. Uh, a lot of times your data systems only have the template name. Our products, of course, need the paths to the labels. Um, that's kind of where we can go into our action editor at that point. And if we have to drop, let's say, a, v a script in there so that we can concatenate the path where our label repository sits and the extension at that LBL, uh, we can do constructs like that. The, the, the set printer, same thing. We can assign it for statics or variables. And the print label, we can also do the same thing. Now, one other thing that I'd like to talk about, and I'm going to go back into uh, our filter real quick, is that a lot of times our systems will have spaces before and after when we're sending these messages out. We've uh, created a utility here where a lot of the common things that we see out in the field, if there's spaces before and after, we can actually check that so we can get that peer data out there. So um, with that in mind, uh, what I'd like to do real quick for you is um, it was great that Nick actually showed us that example of an unstructured filter. So I have an unstructured drop, and I'm going to kind of relate that to, uh, I'm going to show you how to create a filter for one of these unstructured samples. Now, in this particular case, um, what we see here is we had an old legacy system that didn't really have a way to uh, get a message out to the automation product. Now, technically, people don't like to use the word, but um, I find it advantageous for us to think of this as middleware. A lot of times, we get so wrapped up in the labeling solution, we just think about this product uh, for printing labels. I've used the product to take data out of one system, pass it to the new system. I've used it as an import tool to dump it into uh, SQL tables so that we can make web applications up on the internet. Um, the sky's kind of the limit on how we decide to use the automation tool and what we want to use it for. That being said, let me go back to this. This was a legacy system, no way to send a message out. It did have a print button on it, and every operating system has a generic text printer. So let's take, the, uh, <clears throat> let's take that print command and send it to a generic text printer and get us a text file. And this is what you see here. It was a simple report. So what's nice about this structured mechanism here, and I'm going to show you, is that I can actually sit here and I can manually configure, instead of using the automated processes, to dig data out of, my system, you know, out of this, this example that I have. Now, we just don't have to think about this from a position in a document. We also have the ability, say, to look for strings, start and end, and actually take the data in between. Now, where this comes in handy is, is that we, when we're actually trying to uh, uh, think about providing a solution for our customers, might have to worry about price point. I'm getting ready to show you an XML sample with the Pro product. Um, a lot of times, though, that price point might not be what the customer would look at. There is no reason you couldn't actually create an XML filter manually in the Easy product to get to that price point that you would need. Simply by using, uh, say, one of these uh, find string from the start of document, look for your open tag, uh, then look for your close tag, take the data in between. I've kind of gotten a little bit off subject at that point, but what I want to show you here is that the request of the, of the client in this example is to have our header and footer information on each line item, and each line item needs to print a label. It's a great use of our unstructured filter, because what we can do is we can then create a sub area in which we define a block and how many lines is in the data block at that point. So you know, the data block, we have the 13 lines to meet the total spec here. Each line technically is its own unique set of data. We start adding fields again, and you can see that through the combination of how I'm breaking out the data, uh, we are highlighting for each of these data sets. So at the request, if I go into my unstructured filter at this point, 
um, we're going to go back into our action editor, you could see again this after we get that filter created, this just becomes an exercise in, uh, in mapping again. And you can see that all the line items actually will pop up uh, in, my, uh, in my data set. And if I wanted to at this point, I can sit here and uh, we can run a preview just to verify that we are definitely on the right track. So hopefully my day will go good and we'll get a decent example here. Yeah, and let me see here. Okay, so now remember when I was bragging about uh, uh, my variable length issue, I have a variable uh, length problem here. So I want to go back and just look real quick to see um, where I kind of went wrong with this. And I've made some changes to my system, so I might not have been uh, real thorough on this here real quick. So if I would actually go back in here and actually uncheck all these, um, I can give you a preview of that, and once the preview is accepted, we can deploy. Tim, that's, time, that's a nice part about the running the preview now, that feature, so you can actually you know, see an example and deploy it just as a preview before you actually start printing anything, so you can just you know, work out any you know, kinks that you have from the setup, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's, it's instead of going live with it and, and repeatedly sending messages, and it's very time consuming. Now that I have the preview, I can do the work right here in the design editor in and of itself. So if we talk a little bit about, you know, who would need this unstructured, you know, data filter or even the structured, uh, you know, the unstructured, that typically applies to maybe older legacy systems or you know, like that invoice that you showed that had the work order and PO number on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, we can even receive uh, like ZPL or print code, right? And I was going to say, what I'm showing on my screen here is if I wanted to analyze, say, a printer stream, I can actually select for binary data at that point. And we, it'll give us a nice representation of what that binary data looks like from a, a human standpoint so we can get in there, break that data out to actually get text out of a data stream. So, and it would just be a matter of a simple click at that point. Uh, can you merge over to the uh, showing an XML file now with the with the nice label uh, Automation Pro? You bet, you bet. So let me go back in here. Um, what I have is an XML sample here. Okay, so what we can do, and let me bring this up here real quick, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to, uh, uh, and that's because I'm set to easy right now. So if I go back into here, and actually change my product to Pro, um, this will open up just fine for us. Now, in order, here's one of the biggest differences between, say, the Easy and the Pro, is this uh, automatic uh, import of an XML uh, filter into our system. Now, people go, well, I can make it an Easy, right? Well, depending on how complicated that XML filter is, there's time that it takes to actually create that. So the balance is how much time is it going to take my employee to make a manual uh, label so that I can charge a lower price on the licensing. So there's a balance there when we do our analysis to go, well, what is cost effective? Is it cost effective to use the lower end product or do we use the higher end product to save money and maintenance fees and things like that on the charges? So however, to uh, to import this XML structure is very simple. If I wanted to create an XML filter, I would just actually hit my XML filter at that point and tell it to import the data structure. So if I go into my XML sample, and this is an XML file, and maybe what I should do real quick, swinging and missing today. And again, there's tons of business systems out there that now can send XML and use that as the data structure. So it seems to be more and more prominent from a lot of like ERPs and WMS systems too. So, so yeah. So what I'm showing you is basic XML structure. So once that's in place, if if the system's sending it out like that, I select a sample of my XML message, and you can see that it automatically comes in parsed for us. Now, what we do with that filter is turned off at this point. So what I can do is I can actually go into here, I can tell it that I want to assign a variable value for it, and this, and you can see as I'm starting to do this, it's starting to highlight, uh, it's starting to highlight my data sets that it's actually interpreting at that point. So I can sit there, turn on my variables that I would need for my solution, 
and uh, we get that mapping then, and I'll show you that real quick. Bring this other one down. So I, I've just turned on actually all my different fields here. Okay, so once that's technically in place, and I actually have one already kind of created that's actually in this particular, again, I'm using a drop file trigger. The only difference between, say, the drop file trigger and the TCP IP trigger is the fact that instead of listening at a folder, we're going to be listening on a port for a stream of data coming over TCP IP. But if we look at our action editor at this point, I'm selecting my books at XML, and you can see, again, mapping exercise. So at that point, I set a label to, uh, you know, to open. I set my open label to open a label. I set it to a printer I have in-house. I tell it how many I want to print at that point. Maybe I'll get lucky on this preview for us. This looks a little better. And you can see now that I made a real basic label. So, um, but you can see that we can get in here and we can kind of look to make sure that our data is coming through from the XML file we are sent. Now, once that's in place, once we like what we see at that point, we would actually deploy. So it's asking us to save. It's going to deploy. You can see that actually this particular file is actually running. Um, if I go into here real quick, um, and I have my queue up for my RZ400 right now. So we're technically live. I'm watching this particular folder right here. Um, oh, my, no, I am not. I am watching this particular folder right here. So if I drop some data into that folder, what we should start to see happen is that uh, we should start to get a process. And you can see that I'm spooling over to my, uh, my, pr my printer right here. And realistically, and, and you might even hear the printer in the background at that point. So now I got some settings turned on, so that's a little slower than the way it usually comes across, but that's pretty much instantaneous when it happens. So, but uh, that's pretty much a, a very you know brief overview of how easy it is to actually create an XML uh, a trigger in your systems. Now we can do advanced things with the product, and again, uh, from an integration standpoint. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, just I'm going to give you a, a real brief demonstration of the potential of the enterprise product. Um, there's integrations where I, I've seen that uh, a company has a web application in place. They would like to say add a page and use our automation instead of them sending the print stream out. They want a more dynamic, they want to use more printers, have more control over where they send these printers. They've identified that automation would be the perfect thing for them to use in their system. Um, they would like to actually use their web components, and all that they're asking for on top of printing the labels is a simple, simple preview uh, back to their web form. Now, what's nice about that, and what I'm going to do is bring you up an example here real quick. Um, in our, in our, and again, I can't, uh, I've got to turn this to our enterprise. Uh, come on now. So we're in our, our enterprise here real quick. I'll be able to bring this up. So what we ended up doing is that uh, what I've done is I've created a simple web page with a, a JFrame in there. And what we can actually configure our enterprise products to do, and let me show you uh, the range of what we can do. Um, in essence, what I'm actually doing in this example is I'm taking uh, uh, um, uh, an open label command I'm actually redirecting it to an object, and I'm, I'm, I'm passing that into a variable, that binary data into a variable, and then sending it over a stream back to their web page so that they can preview the label. Uh, just the long end of the short of it, this gets relatively complicated, not too bad. Um, but once that's in place, um, let me deploy real quick, and I'm going to show you just the potential of some of the non-standard things we can do at this point. Um, let me look here. Okay, so we have our label return value. I have a simple web page here that we actually go to. Um, if I would put some data into here and hit submit, you can see that we can feed a, a preview back uh, uh, to an existing system. So as long as the web developer there gives us a JFrame and uh, we do some simple configuration at that point.
And Tim, this is a new feature that was added to uh, Automation uh, Enterprise 1.2. I know re re we recently had some uh, PR that went out about this, but it really gives you a, a lot more power for you know, web developers or people who have their own web page that you know, want to serve up a preview of that label on that web page. So it's something really cool. Yeah, correct. And, and like I say, the, the sky becomes the limit at that point. And uh, if I go back into here real quick, um, again, we'll take a real quick look at uh, uh, the actions that we get in the enterprise. But uh, you can see that we can start doing XML manipulations, and uh, uh, we got a fair amount of database stuff we can do. We can send any kind of message or data file back to any other type of system at that point. So uh, yeah, it becomes uh, it becomes quite exciting from a, a solution integration standpoint. So, but that's pretty much what I have for a live demonstration today. So, Nick, I don't know if you want to open up the uh, the floor to questions or anything. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tim. I will uh, unmute the phones here, so uh, you can ask any questions that you may have. And we also have a chat window too that you can uh, communicate with for any chat questions. And we'll also send out an we'll email, to send email to everybody. So if you have questions you want to talk offline. We have a recording made of this presentation, so uh, we'll make sure to email that to everybody who uh, attended today so you can pass it around to anybody else from your organization. All right, well, Tim and I will stick around here for a, a little bit. If anyone has any questions they would like to ask or just reply to the email we'll send out, we can touch base offline. Uh, uh, I have a few questions, but a lot of models, maybe I can I can write down here. Uh, yes, hold on one second. I will uh, mute some others here. Okay, you should be good to talk now. Well, uh, you know, uh, when we just connect these databases uh, in the automation part, can we just connect different part databases or different files? Is it possible? I mean, I just get some files from the SAP system and I will just put a, another trigger. Is it possible? Yeah, about configuring multiple triggers with multiple messages at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very possible. In fact, uh, in, in uh, I've seen examples where we literally had hundreds of triggers running at the same time. That's so nice. mm -hmm. I would say, and the other the other thing is that again, um, the pro in the enterprise is multi-threaded. So mm -hmm. um, you know, through a, the proper management of, of how many uh, print engines you need instantiated at the time, performance can be great with that. But yeah, um, in certain medical environments too, I've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, 150, 300 triggers actually waiting to do something. These mm -hmm. triggers. So. Mm -hmm. And I have actually two additional questions. One, one of them is about automation. And the first one is, can we do a, a self-replicating or you know, load balancing process inside? I mean, if I have let's say more than 10 printers, mm -hmm. and when I just put the trigger. Uh, you know, can uh, nice label do the automation for these jobs? I mean, the, uh, the replicating process or you know, spread each file to each printer. Yes, and in fact, realistically, again, because we can leverage Microsoft's clustering services, mm -hmm. um, if we set up a cluster and we're we're configured for load balancing at that point. Uh, we let Microsoft handle that, and it balances out our, you know, we set up a bunch of, say, TCPIP triggers or HTTP triggers. We let, we let Microsoft clustering that at that point handle the load balancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's, that's good. That's good. And, you know, one additional, this is the last one. <laughs> I swear it's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no, questions are good. Questions Definitely. are good. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, you know, when you, you just open a, let's say, CSV file inside the automation manager, you know, let's say there is a city or state area. You know, I want to, uh, let's say, some cities, uh, some of the cities want to be, uh, let's say, uh, go into a PDF document and some of them is, I mean, it's a rule dependent process. Uh, if the cities are, let's say, San Francisco, it will be printed. And if, uh, let's say, they are Chicago, they will be stored as a PDF file. Can I do it inside the automation, or do I have to do it before I just bring the file? No, in, in fact, you can do it in automation. So a lot of times I've seen a couple different ways we can implement that is we can actually set up uh, two sets of open labels, set printers. One would have a redirect to PDF on it. So you technically have, say, seven actions here. These would be duplicated. Um, but if you look, let me show you something here real quick. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can see. I can see. Okay, I want to look here because what we can do then is on that second set of three, we can set some conditional if-thens in there. Okay, so we can say if a field equals state name or uh, a, if a field does not equal state name, uh, you know, print this or do not print this. So these first three would have one condition on it so that we'd only print a label. The second three with the redirect to the, the PDF would have another set of conditions on it so they would only print when those conditions were met. So it's very doable in the automation. We, we can do it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Yep, thank you for My your question. Question. Sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Class. All right. Are there uh, any other questions? I have. Uh, any other questions? I have. All right, great. Well, I appreciate everybody for attending today's webinar, and we'll send out an email to everybody uh, with the recap of today's session and a video so you can pass it on to anybody else who may be interested, and we'll make sure to keep you in the loop on other future webinars. We uh, have a YouTube page as well that uh, has over 50 videos touching label design, touching automation, getting into power forms for creating own custom printing screens, uh, you know, how to create basically any type of barcode in nice label, database connections. So those are really great uh, videos to take a look at or pass anybody else who might be just getting started with nice label. So thank you, Tim, for the demo today, and uh, you know, everybody have a great weekend.